Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to, welcome to all. Uh, before we begin, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, this evening's meeting is being held on the uh, land of the territory of the Wasonic Nation. Uh, and I'd like to call to order a regular council meeting for Monday, June 24th at 7 p.m. And uh, we begin with public participation. Uh, we have a maximum of about 20 minutes. We invite speakers to come up for about three minutes. Uh, please introduce, uh, give us your name and address, press the little button for the red light, which means your speaker's on, and we welcome for the first time any speakers. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Jocelyn Gifford, 10448 Albay Road. I am uh, here to talk about, uh, briefly, about the urban forest strategy. Um, I am a member of the um, Habitat and Environment Committee of the Sydney Community Association, which will be represented a bit later by Linda Comber. I want to support and add to her um, comments um, the SCA has, the Sydney Community Association, has um, worked on this, on the urban forest strategy and, and provided input, um, I think at each stage of the process where it was possible to do that. And um, we are, speaking for myself, the committee hasn't met yet, really pleased to see the um, to see the outcome and last week to hear the kind of uh, commitment that you're all expressing about um, doing the best that we can as a community to implement um, we had a, a meeting back in October to respond to the first um, round of uh, requests for input and after that, um, in December, ha uh, did a survey which received 65 responses from members and non-members of the community association. And that was specifically uh, speaking to ask, asking people's opinions about what, how they wanted to be involved with trees in their community and what they were willing to do. And. Uh, more wanted to be involved and, and were concerned about transparency and knowing what was going on than were, in, than were interested in actually volunteering. But a significant minority did want to volunteer and did want to pull ivy and uh, water, water trees on the boulevard and help to, to preserve the trees that mean so much to us. Now I think it's time to think about implementation. Um, I was certainly disappointed by the um, no net loss um, uh, goal for the, for the next little while. And the people that we surveyed certainly could see a loss, the majority of them. Um, what we hear from the IPCC about climate change is that it's important. We have about 10 years not to start work on, um, on reducing and sequestering carbon, but to finish work in order to avoid the worst, um, the worst impacts of climate change. So the more, I know you have put it off, put it off, well, you haven't put it off. You've said you'll deal with it in the strategic planning process in the fall and wherever possible um, between now and then, which is great. So I, I really want to um, say that uh, I think significant numbers of Sydney citizens will be working, working with you and watching that process and some supporting it to be as, as robust as possible. Thanks very much. Thanks for those comments. I'll ask for a second time if anyone is wishing to uh, speak this evening. Seeing none, I'll uh, bring public participation to a close. 
And we do have uh, a presentation uh, by Linda Comer from the Sydney Community Association. Welcome, Linda. Hi, uh, my name's Linda Comber. I live at 317 10459 Rest Haven Drive. And I'm the, I belong to the SCA, the Sydney Community Association, and the Environment Habitat um, Committee. I'm ahead of that one. <clears throat> and um, I, I know that you've heard many, many times, and everybody knows the value of trees. Trees are so important. They help us regulate global warming. They provide scenery. Um, privacy, aesthetic value, they give us food, uh, medicine, shelter, beauty, serenity. Without trees, the world would be un uninhabitable. Um, <clears throat> trees and green space increase neighborhood pride and real estate values. So that would in, in, I mean, interest a lot of people is if they're not concerned about the environment, at least they're concerned about money. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> trees help uh, create fertile soil. Tree roots bind the soil and fight erosion. And they shield, the leaves shield uh, the earth from drying effects of wind and sun. Trees are the planet's lungs. So I would um, like to just contribute this little thing that I'm interested in. And I've been involved um, in two or three of the, the um, <clears throat> tree appreciation days in central Saanich. And um, I've gone up over there and, and dug holes and put trees in and fertilizer and everybody went yay. And then there was families and children and uh, the Lions Club, uh, Club um, provided food and coffee and uh, it was all very exciting and a lot of public participation. So I wrote a letter in February saying I thought that would be a great idea. And then we got together with the mayor and Brian Robinson and Randy <laughs> Humble on, in March. <clears throat> and I presented my ideas there, and uh, they said, well, let's wait till we see what we're going to do with the urban forest thing that was going on. And I've been to all the public input things that there could possibly be input. I've written out all these <laughs> advice <laughs> that I have. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> so uh, there's, there's several communities that, um, that already have a Tree Appreciation Day, and it's called Arbor Day in some places. And of course, um, it, it started a long time ago, 1990, oh, it was um, Tree Canada started in Ottawa. And since 1992, Tree Canada, who supplies trees sometimes, if you need some trees supplied, they've planted 80 million trees since then in Canada. <clears throat> and uh, so Oak Bay and Victoria, Glanford Park, Saanich, Central Saanich, um, they, <clears throat> they all have a Tree Appreciation Day and they've been doing it for a long time. And it brings the community involvement and people together. Um, and I, I really think that Sydney could, could have one. I, I, you know, and, and if you're not sure, you could ask them how they did it. <laughs> I'm sure there's lots of information to, to set up one. These are some of the papers that they, they put a big ad in the paper like this. Tree Appreciation Day. Did you know that one large tree can provide a day's oxygen for four people? or that trees have a f psychological impact on one's mood and also intercept rainfall and reduce runoff. And that's one of their ads, there's another one of their ads. They put a big ad in the paper every time it's due and it starts usually in November. <coughs> Anyways, um, from the SLA we had, this was our <coughs> suggestions in our little input, was Tree Appreciation Day as is done in neighboring municipalities hold a community event to plant trees, inform and engage residents about the role of trees in a healthy community. So that's what I'd like to see. Plus, um, <clears throat> the implementation, implementation <coughs> plan, short-term actions uh, presented by Barefoot, they, um, they've listed in the short-term actions an Arbor Day celebration. Uh, work with the community partners to create an annual Arbor Day celebration was one of their suggestions for short term. And it certainly would bring the community together and bring awareness to the tree situation. I'd really like to see um, more trees growing in our community um, uh, instead of just holding the line. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to item two, uh, look for approval of our agenda. So moved. 
Um, Mr. Mayor, I wonder if we could move 7A um, perhaps up to uh, 3B. Uh, we've got a group of young kids in the audience who just might um, let them come up a bit sooner. Sorry, 7A to where? 7A, which is the petition, mm -hmm. uh, and move it after 3A. Uh, I'll amend the, the second. Okay, sure, we can do that. I just got to change my roadmap here. I'll call the question. Those in favor? The motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Now look for adoption of our regular council meeting minutes from June the 10th. Move adoption. Second. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. We'll now move to the new th item 3B. A request uh, for ban on single-use plastic bags. Uh, we have a, uh, a petition being submitted this evening by Margot Arndt, a student from and student from the Deep Cove Elementary School. Welcome. <laughs> oh, don't be nervous. It's easy to say. <laughs> just just pull the microphone down and we'll, if that helps. Yeah, there you go. Good evening, Your Worship and Councillors. My name is Marco and I'm nine years old. I'm here to speak to you today because I would like you to ban plastic shopping bags in Sydney. We know from scientific research that plastic bags are mistaken for food by turtles and other sea creatures. We need to stop using them. Canada is the fifth largest producer of plastic waste per capita in the world, so we're not the worst polluters. But banning plastic bags is an easy change, and it is definitely something everyone can do to help the environment. The federal government has announced a ban on single-use plastics starting in 2021. Victoria, Sandage, and Souk have also voted to ban plastic bag use. I would love if we could do the same. According to numbers from the town of Sydney and North Saanich websites, the population of Sydney and North Saanich, who are most likely to shop in Sydney, is 23,000 people. According to the Plastic Oceans Foundation of Canada, as many as 200 bags are used per year per person. That means that between now and when the federal ban goes into place in 2021, that is 500 days and 300 bags per person. Banning now means we'll stop 6,900,000 bags from entering the environment. Now, I know that many people in Sydney do bring and use, do bring and use reusable bags, but it's hard to estimate how many bags are saved. Recycling isn't the answer. It's better to reduce and reuse or come up with alternate, 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 alternate. Alternatives to plastic. Recycling only works if there are companies to buy the recycling, and more and more plastics aren't being recycled. Plastic bags or soft plastics no longer go into the blue box recycling, and three bottle depots in Victoria no longer accept plastic shopping bags. So far, Ireland Return it and Sydney still accept soft plastics. I started a change.org petition with my mom's help, and 332 people have signed to say that they would support a ban on plastic bags. 161 staff and students at Deep Cove Elementary and 14 at Sydney Elementary said they would supp also support the ban. We know from the survey that was previously presented to you by Deep Cove students that 50 out of 57 businesses also, also support a ban. Thank you for hearing my presentation this evening. Thank you very much for your very current information that uh, you and your classmates put together. I'll open it up to council. Uh, do council members have any uh, any questions? Like to present it? Uh, Councillor Fellow. Thank you very much for that presentation. I wonder if you can tell me, some people say that they use their grocery bags or their plastic shopping bags that they get for garbage. Um, and so they're gonna be buying garbage bags instead. Do you have any information about that? Is there anything you can tell me about that? Okay. It's just, you know, sometimes we use plastic this way and we use plastic that. And this is one way to, to reduce our plastic. So I, don't, I think it's a great idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I, um, Councillor O'Keefe? Oh, no. I was just going to say um, that was a very good presentation and is very timely because 
on the news today, there was another report about the amount of plastic that is going into our environment and our oceans every year. I can't remember how many tons it was every day. So I think your idea is a good idea. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. At a previous, uh, uh, a previous meeting of council when uh, Councillor Duncan uh, presented the results of your first petition where 50 out of 57 Sydney businesses. Um, I made some remarks at that meeting that I'd like to, to repeat for those who weren't here at the time. And that is, uh, personally, I'm very supportive of, of a ban on plastic bags. Um, and uh, as your representative to the Capital Regional District, which is all 13 municipalities working together, um, the Capital Regional District uh, considered last term a request from Victoria to implement a plastic bag ban region-wide. So it would have been in all 13 municipalities and the three electoral areas, Salt Spring and the other Gulf Islands at the same time. And personally, I think that's, uh, that's the best way to go because you would have the same uh, bylaw in place all over. You would have the same rules, whether it costs this much for a paper bag or this much for a reusable bag and, and so on. Unfortunately, the Capital Regional District uh, didn't, uh, decided not to do that and Victoria went ahead on their own and they implemented uh, a bag a ban that I st think started in the early spring of last year and it's uh, two stages and some of the prices go up uh, January of this year. Uh, and uh, now Saanich has taken the decision that they will implement in January of 2020, yet the other municipalities are either considering or not going to go forward. Uh, there was a lawsuit uh, ag against Victoria um, about uh, the ban on plastic bags, and Victoria won that lawsuit, I believe, in 2018. However, another, another lawsuit has, has recently been uh, initiated by the, I believe it's the Plastic Bag Association of Canada, and uh, against the city of Victoria. Um, again, personally, I hope, and I, I know many in the community uh, hope that Victoria is, again, successful in that legal action, but I think uh, what I would prefer to see, or what I, I think is the best way forward, is to see how that court action, uh, what the results of that is. But go back to the cap myself as a representative of the Sydney community, is to go to the Capital Regional District Board in the fall, uh, when more is known, and say, let's move together on this, and not just have one municipality do it this year, one municipality do it next year. Let's, as a region, implement the same, same bylaws. So, I'm, I'm committed personally to do that at the Capital Regional District. Um, our council uh, can now consider a motion, uh, if you will, uh, whether you'd like to consider it further in our strategic planning uh, this year. Uh, it will take a, 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 a significant portion of staff time to work on a bylaw to, to implement that. And currently we don't really have that in our staff resources for this year because of the budget that we've and projects that we've put in place. But um, a council, do you have, um, What's your preference? Well, <clears throat> I would, since we've declared a climate change emergency, I would, I would like to see us move forward on a ban with plastic bags. And I know that, you know, that some staff time w might be required, but I'm wondering whether, you know, knowing that there's other municipalities that have put, um, you know, bans in place already, whether we can, take those bylaws and take a look at them and, and see whether they're, they're, you know, suitable for us as well. So I would be willing to consider that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it would make sense and it's more efficient if we can do it collectively through the CRD. And um, with respect, I don't think um, plastic bags have very much to do with climate action. Like it is an environmental issue, but it's not a, a climate change related issue. So I don't see it has that kind of a emergency status that climate action would. Um, and if we pick up one of the other municipalities bylaws and then it fails in court, we're gonna wind up um, essentially with extra effort where if we wait and see what the outcome of that court case is, um, perhaps we can do it regionally, which I think would make a lot more sense. So I, I'm in favor of, uh, of waiting and see how it turns out. 
Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Oh, oh. oh, okay. I, I was going to say, um, so it sounds like the CRD is going to revisit this in the mm -hmm. fall. It, they won't revisit it unless a director or one of the representatives from one of the municipalities that brings it forward again. Okay. But we're expecting that the court case would be we resolved. Don't know. Again, I'm sorry, we don't know the timing of the outcome of the court case. Okay. Councillor Rintoul. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Margaret, for the presentation. Much appreciated. Um, you know, I... I, I feel like uh, communities uh, elsewhere have moved forward with this. Margot's report showed a number of communities, municipalities that have considered this and given discussion to it. Uh, the mayor's added some, some insight uh, this evening with regard to uh, the CRD and um, the possibility of, of uh, the 13 municipalities acting in harmony on this. Um, uh, that doesn't seem to happen often enough for my liking, but I'm pleased that you know uh, the prospect is there of readdressing it. I, I'm, I'm cognizant of, of uh, staff time and, and the implication that may come with this suggestion um, but I'd be uh, keen so that we don't see this um, slip off our radar and I know we won't because of Margot's uh, diligence here this evening um, that perhaps we see a report from staff on uh, you know in order to provide council with an update with regard to the, uh, the, the, the legal matter that you've referred to Mr. Mayor uh, as well as the previous initiative at the CRD level and what municipalities uh, have done aside from uh, from Victoria, uh, so that we at least have that uh, information and that background available and ready to us to further discuss this and, and hopefully move it forward and perhaps educate ourselves prior to going to the, to the CRD. And so if there's an appetite uh, for a motion of that nature, I'd be happy uh, to move uh, this matter uh, to staff and ask to report back to uh, council with regard to the current status of uh, other municipalities initiatives and the uh, impending legal challenges facing this matter i will second that second um does staff wish to wish to comment at all in terms of the work that might be involved uh, yeah at this point it's it's tough to say i mean i'm going to say it's probably a fair bit of work to to do some research to find out uh, i guess what the status is of of in summarizing you know other municipalities that are looking at it uh, their bylaws etc i mean it's there's there's quite a bit on the go right now with the ocp review with current planning and and uh, and such so um certainly if that's council's desire uh, but it might be helpful to know the level of urgency that council maybe sees regarding this and what the expectation is around timing in terms of reporting back is this something you want to see this summer or the fall or so i'm I'm just wondering about the timing and the level of urgency associated with this. Uh, Councillor Rintoul, I have a comment as well, but Councillor Rintoul. Uh, thank you uh, for the mayor through the staff. But, uh, yeah, again, I'm cognizant of, of that aspect of this request. And in my mind, um, you know, with an aim to ensure uh, it's, it's, um, it's current, it's fresh in our minds as we go into strategic planning would be the uh, goal with respect to timing. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, early, early fall, I think, would be certainly helpful to go to... Uh, to go back to CRD with the information and then uh, move from there. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I'm just thinking about making a, a more direct motion. It, it doesn't sound like, what it sounds like we're really looking for is whether or not Victoria wins the lawsuit again. I think it's just a challenge by the Plastic Bag Association. I think it's an appeal. I think it's the same organization, the same challenge, and they're likely to lose it again. Um, so really, if they had come back and said they've lost it, Victoria has won it again, it sounds like you were willing to go forward to the CRD and, and ask them. And I don't know. It sounds like all I've heard is support around the table for as long as kind of bringing forward that initiative at the CRD level. Um, if, we, if we make a motion, just move that Mayor Cliff McNeil-Smith um, Brings to, brings okay. to, yeah, well, we sorry. Have, we, have an ex we have a current motion on the oh, floor. Oh, sorry, you're right. So we, we can't have a subsequent motion if you wish. Um, but um, I think, to, to Council Wainwright's point, I think uh, we could proceed and, and, and move forward to try and create a bylaw uh, similar or the same as to, to other municipal bylaws. Uh, but uh, the outcome of the, uh, of the legal challenge to Victoria could have different scenarios. It could have a scenario where nothing changes. It could have a change where their bylaw has to change in some respect. 
uh, and you know, hopefully it's not defeated entirely and you have to start from square one, but, but which would then mean additional work for, and uh, quite frankly, uh, while I haven't spoken to my colleagues on CRD board uh, directly on, on this, uh, I, I think some other municipalities are, are waiting on this as well. So I'm certainly willing to take direction from Council with regards to CRD in a subsequent motion. But Councillor O'Keefe. So what I like about this motion, though, is that um, we'll get some information in the fall uh, in terms of looking at what other municipalities, what those bylaws uh, uh, are and whether they might be adaptable here. So if in the fall things still aren't resolved with in terms of this court case, at least we have some information, more information in terms of those other bylaws that we could then decide at that point to to move ahead. Because it sounds to me like even if we dis we said today, yeah, you know, we're going to go ahead despite what is going on with the court case or the CRD, there would still be some uh, time required on staff's part to do some research on it. So. I'm happy to, to wait for staff to do that research and then come back to us in the fall and then decide um, what sort of route to take. Yeah. And just a, another thing uh, with regards to uh, getting information and strategic planning is uh, while council will consider its strategic plan in the fall and the, and the new initiatives that we will take on in 2020, um, those initiatives could commence sometime during the year, so it doesn't mean we have to we either have to start a plastic bag ban on January 1st or wait another year. We, we can, Victoria started it mid-year and we could start it partway through the year as well. So uh, there isn't a time constraint in, in that sense. Uh, Councillor uh, Councilor Garnett and Councillor Fallot. Uh, yeah, first I want to say thank you, Margo, for your presentation. I commend you on standing up there and doing that and hopefully it'll be a start of a lifelong standing up and for, for, the, for all, all kinds of issues. Um, I think it's important. It's not a climate part of a climate emergency per se, but there it is. There is an urgency to it. So, I think getting something started along the lines with uh, Councillor Rentoul said, I think is a, is a good way to start, and we'll show that we're really serious about doing something about it. So, I'm prepared to, for, to support your motion. Councillor Fellow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margo, and and your class for coming here and making this presentation. I think it's. Uh, uh, it's nice to see what's important to you and uh, to to be able to say back to you that it's important to us as well. And even though we're probably talking at a level that might not be of interest to you, we are looking at making this move forward. And um, it's we're all committed. I think you've got that indication. So thank you very much. Appreciate your time and effort. And I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Margo. We'll now move on to item uh, 4A, a request for street vending license uh, and the sale of watercolor paintings. And I'll refer to Mr. Humble uh, for an introduction. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so at the previous council meeting of uh, June 10th, there was a motion that the applicant be granted uh, approval for a business license to establish a mobile stand for uh, selling selling of art. Um, so this motion, as Council's aware, was defeated uh, unanimously. So unfortunately, however, as no subsequent motion was made to do something else with the request uh, by the applicant, uh, for example, deny, deny the request, uh, the matter was basically left in a bit of a state of limbo. So. Uh, Accordingly, as a matter of uh, procedural housekeeping, uh, we brought it back, uh, placed it on a council agenda so that uh, an appropriate resolution can occur to, uh, to address the matter. I'll move that the request for a business license be denied. Second. Any discussion? Uh, Councillor Pellet. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I thought about this since last week, and I looked up the bylaw, and I see that the proponent... Um, is not asking for anything unusual, anything that we don't have a by. I mean, this is a current bylaw from September of last year. And um, I would really like to see uh, this request be approved. Um, I think it is a look-see. We haven't had certainly not a lot of requests to do something like that. I don't know if we've had any in the past. Um, I think. Um, 
the proponent also is very circumspect about what she is asking for space and, and for her timing. Um, I think it fits within our vibrancy uh, and our level of activity that we do. It is supportive of small business person. Not every artist is going to display in a gallery and not every purchaser of art is going to walk into a gallery. And I think this is an opportunity to try it out. And I would, um, I would like to see this um, be supported. Thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. So my thinking has evolved a bit on this since last time. I looked at, I looked at the bylaw, and uh, the applicant is is meeting the, the requirements of of the bylaw. Um, my initial concerns were that we would have uh, lots of people coming forward wanting to do this, and um, at the time I talked about having maybe some sort of process where. People could apply once a year. Uh, we would look at look and vet all of the requests at the same time. We would have uh, certain locations identified, um, and so I still think that's a good idea. However, what I'm thinking is that for this summer, at least, it might be a good idea to allow this one, and if there's others that come forward, we can look at them on a, a case by case basis just to get a sense, I'd, I would look at it as a, like a pilot project to look at um, how well these are received. Um, it would be an opportunity for us to get feedback from the community, either positive or negative. And then at the end of the summer, then we would be in a better position in order to determine whether this is something that we want to do on a broader scale. So last time we talked about the type of vibrancy it brings to uh, the community and places, I think we talked about Kelowna and Victoria, that have street vendors. And I think it does add um, that, that little bit of extra something. So, so I would be willing to approve the, uh, the requests for this summer and consider other ones um, in, on sort of a pilot sort of basis. Seeing no other comments, uh, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. I'll now move to item five. Uh, it's business arising from minutes, and it's uh, these are from our. This is for information only. Uh, we have no resolution. Uh, but uh, at the uh, June tenth uh, council and camera meeting. Um, we did a number of things uh, with regards to appointments to the new Economic Advisory Committee. And I would like to read that one, uh, that staff advertised for members to, service, to serve on the new Economic Advisory Committee. Uh, two, that staff contact the nominating organizations uh, requesting a member to serve on the new uh, committee. Uh, that the new members to the committee be appointed for a term to end in December 2021. And lastly, that staff contact the 2018 applicants advising them of council's decision. Um, so that's for information here at, at, uh, at council meeting. Um, by passing that resolution at the in-camera meeting, we've actually moved forward and some may have seen the notice uh, in the paper that was first posted in the paper last Friday. Uh, we have no delegations. Uh, we have uh, covered item seven. I'll now move to the mayor's report. Uh, I do have a number of, uh, of things to report uh, this evening. <clears throat> the first is uh, that uh, we at the town were uh, saddened to learn today of the passing of uh, former Fire Chief uh, Mel Baldwin. Um, uh, Chief, uh, Sydney Fire Chief Mel Baldwin uh, passed away on June 21st, uh, 2019. He was 83 years old. He began his career with the fire department in 1951, spanning a 46 year career until he retired in 1997. He was promoted to fire chief in 1976 and served as chief until 1990. Mel was the oldest living retired member of the Sydney Fire Department. Mel will be remembered fondly and will be deeply missed by all those who knew him and served with him. In remembrance of former fire chief, uh, Baldwin, the flag at the community safety building will be flown at half mast for the remainder of the week. On behalf of council and the town, we want to offer our condolences to the Baldwin family 
and uh, we're ex uh, extremely grateful for the service that he gave to the community in his lengthy career. Uh, and this is from uh, a press release issued by our fire chief, uh, Mickelson, earlier today. Thank you, uh, Chief. Uh, my second update is a CRD update. Uh, at the Wednesday, the Wednesday, June uh, 12th uh, monthly board meeting of the CRD, we approved the 2018 CRD annual report. Uh, and I mention it this evening because uh, I am uh, a, a council, the community's representative to the CRD. Uh, the CRD has a budget in excess of $600 million this year. It has 1,100 employees, but it provides many important and valuable services uh, either on a regional basis, on a sub-regional basis, uh, or locally. And uh, on the peninsula, we're very familiar with two sub-regional services, uh, or three sub-regional services, our Water Commission and Wastewater Commission. Uh, Councillor Wainwright is chair of both of those commissions uh, involving uh, the peninsula representatives. And um, we have the Panorama Rec Commission, uh, which myself and Councillor Rentoul sit on, along with our colleagues on the other uh, uh, peninsula. I encourage, every, the reason I mention the annual report is I think uh, for those who may be less familiar with uh, the, the things that the CRD does, it is a great uh, introduction to the Capital Regional District. Uh, it's 70 pages long. Uh, there are lots of uh, information in the way of charts and graphs, but it uh, very well presents the range of services provided, uh, as well as budget information and, and, and so on. And so I encourage uh, folks to, to do that. It's available online on the CRD website. Um, uh, CAO Robert Lapham, uh, CRD CAO Robert Lapham, uh, released the report uh, last week, and our, our council members received a, a report electronically uh, uh, last week as well. Uh, my next report is uh, on Saturday, June fifteenth. I attended uh, the Peninsula and Area Agricultural Commission annual Peninsula Farm Tour, uh, and I found it an invaluable six six and a half hour tour. Uh, we visited several, uh, several different types of farms on the Saanich Peninsula. Uh, the Halliburton Community Organic Farm uh, in Saanich. Uh, the Mitchell's Farm in, uh, in Central Saanich. Mitchell's Farm is uh, 400, uh, they, the, they're in the sixth generation of farming. Uh, over 400 acres and they grow 50 varieties of fruits and vegetables. Um, we then went on to Longview Farms, which is the largest organic farm on Vancouver Island. Uh, and learn things about um, uh, foreign workers. They're looking to, they've applied to the Agricultural Land uh, Commission for 49 residences, uh, uh, they're in trailers uh, for foreign w farm workers. Uh, farms on the peninsula on Vancouver Island throughout British Columbia rely on uh, foreign workers for, uh, for farming, they have for decades. Um, we then went on to, um, to Urban Bee Honey Farm, uh, which is kind of unique, opened last year. We went to a, to a um, Sorry, we also heard from a, um, from Fernbank Farm, uh, and the owners of that farm are one of the founding families of the BC Egg Marketing Board, and the family has been providing eggs and poultry for over 60 years on Vancouver Island. Um, and we learned about some of the challenges they're facing in their, um, in their industry. Uh, we then went on to, uh, to a winery, Rath Gen Cellars, uh, which operates from the former um, Babes Honey Farm. Uh, we learned about the wine, not only the winery, but the, uh, the some 12 vineyards that are, 12 to 15 vineyards that are on the peninsula. Um, and then we had, um, we, has, we had some other presentations, including from the Horse Council of, uh, of British Columbia. So wide ranging, it, it certainly showed the diversity of farm uses on the peninsula. Um, and the reason I mention it is because while we don't have any farms here in Sydney, uh, we certainly eat. And, uh, and take part in other, other aspects of the uh, agricultural community. And um, recently our council was, uh, uh, had a referral from CRD with regards to the Food Lands Trust. And I have to say that this tour opened, uh, opened me, uh, opened my uh, thinking to, uh, to Farmlands Trust, provided additional information. And I've put a, uh, uh, just this evening before council meeting, I've put a package that was given to each of us. I asked for six additional copies with regards to that farm tour, and, and so that's available to you. Uh, this past Friday, I attended uh, two events. In the morning, um, I attended the, um, the Chief Dan George uh, opening of the exhibit at the uh, Sydney Museum, um, uh, a, remarkable, uh, a remarkable exhibit from uh, Chief, uh, 
uh, celebrating Chief Jan George, who is uh, an actor, an activist. He was, sorry, he was chief of the Silwaytu uh, Nation in, uh, on the North Shore of Vancouver. Uh, he, lived, he, was, uh, he lived from 1899 to 1981, uh, but he was an actor, uh, an activist, and also an author. And uh, it was most appropriate that uh, we opened that on, or that was opened on National Indigenous Peoples Day on Friday. And uh, we had the uh, Sartlip uh, Nation and uh, drummers and singers, and they provided a very moving uh, open cer opening ceremony and, um, and through that event. Uh, later that afternoon, uh, we had the grand opening of the Sydney Community Safety Building, um, and that was, um, that was a, a, a great celebration of a significant uh, accomplishment in our community, uh, the largest uh, capital infrastructure program, or, uh, capital infrastructure program uh, in Sydney's history, uh, and uh, we certainly celebrated the accomplishment and also the, uh, uh, the contribution of our career and volunteer firefighters and first responders uh, in Sydney. On um, this past Saturday, I attended um, a presentation at the Shoals Center put on by Habitat for Humanity. Uh, and uh, some in the audience uh, may be aware that North Saanich uh, recently rezoned and approved a development just to the south of uh, Sydney on Lockside Drive um, that will include a small park uh, around uh, Ray Creek as it enters the ocean, uh, a uh, a uh, small uh, subdivision of market houses, but there will also be 10 townhomes, Habitat for Humanity townhomes. Uh, and this presentation was, uh, was the second this week uh, for applicants who would be interested in uh, qualifying uh, to become the owners of one of these 10 homes. Um, and it was an eye-opening experience. Uh, affordable housing is, uh, is in our strategic plan. It's one of the larger issues uh, for our municipality as it is in the region. And um, uh, Habit Habitat for Humanity has placed uh, over 3,500 families uh, in Canada s into homes uh, since 1985. And uh, they've changed their model substantially uh, over the years. Uh, and um, um, I congratulate North Saanich uh, Council and Community in, in bringing those, uh, those homes available in, in North Saanich. And um, with having had that experience and met the executive director from Habitat for Humanity after the presentation, uh, I would like to, uh, to suggest uh, if council would consider a motion to uh, move a discussion of uh, uh, contacting Habitat for Humanity during our official or prior to our official community plan and look at opportunities that might be presented here in Sydney uh, on Sydney uh, vacant uh, Sydney land. Uh, for a Habitat for Humanity project. They now do projects as small as one, uh, one residence uh, up to uh, larger projects such as this 10 uh, unit project in, uh, in North Saanich. I, <coughs> I move that uh, we ask Habitat for Humanity to come and give a presentation to council as part of our uh, strategic, oh, well, sometime in the early fall, yeah. Sometime in the early fall. Second. Sure. Any discussion? I'll call the question. And, and Habitat for Humanity. And, and the other reason I mention it is if anybody in the audience, uh, two of the criteria, and there are many criteria for being eligible to become an owner of a Habitat for Humanity uh, home, uh, but once you are an owner, you own it forever until you make a decision to sell it. Uh, but there is a, a lengthy and, and, and very involved uh, application process. But two of the criteria are having an income, a family gross income uh, between thirty-five and eighty thousand dollars, and the second is having a child, at least one child under the age of ten. Uh, and so, if anybody in the audience or listening uh, knows of uh, of someone in our community uh, who might be interested, uh, certainly direct them to the Habitat for Humanity site. Um, they have a process to work through uh, that you have to work through their uh, through their website. Um, sorry, did I call the question? I did? No. 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 I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, yesterday, uh, Sunday, at the uh, uh, Councillors Wainwright, O'Keefe, and Garnet, and I attended the Sydney Community Association AGM. Uh, MLA Adam Olson and I were guest speakers. Uh, and I think uh, one of the notable things during the, uh, uh, during the AGM was a presentation. Uh, the the, the uh, Sydney Community Association is uh, celebrating its uh, fourth anniversary. It's established itself uh, some four years ago. Uh, but they, um, they made the first award of a new community 
Recognition Award, uh, the Hel Hewitt Helmstein Community Award, and I just wanted to recognize um, Jocelyn Gifford as the recipient of that inaugural award uh, from the Community Association. Jocelyn was involved from the, um, uh, uh, from the beginning with the Sydney Community Association, and it's turned out to be a, a vibrant organization in our community. Uh, looking ahead, we have our annual Sydney Days festivities uh, organized by Peninsula Celebrations and involving many other groups in the community. Uh, just a reminder that um, next Saturday, um, sorry, I'm going to leave that to a council report. Uh, next Saturday, there's uh, the Dinner on Rouge uh, community dinner at 5.30 in Beacon Park, and you can register for that or sign up for that on the Mary Winspear site um, on sa Sunday, June 30th. Uh, there's a sidewalk sale and Beacon Avenue is closed for the same blocks as the summer market, a beer gardens, um, all sorts of other activities. Uh, and then at 7.30 p.m. there will be some opening ceremonies um, and speakers, uh, Elizabeth May, Adam Olson, myself, Mayor Lori Gear from Anacortes uh, is joining us. And, um, and then we'll have the uh, musical fireworks extravaganza at 10.15, uh, which just was formally approved just, uh, just minutes ago. Um, and then on Monday, we have our Sydney Lions Pancake Breakfast, the Canada Day Parade at 1130. Uh, and uh, we have the Community Safety Building Open House from 1 to 3 p.m. on Sunday. We invite uh, the entire community to tour the, uh, the new Community Safety Building. Uh, Mayor and my council colleagues, and I think we also have uh, Elizabeth May and Adam Olson uh, uh, roped in to, s to serve some 2,000 servings of ice cream. Um, so please join us for that and bring family family along. Uh, there will be a helicopter water rescue dem uh, a demonstration off Beacon Park waterfront in the afternoon. And of course, it caps off with this slag uh, build-a-boat uh, uh, race at 4.30. So please join us for those uh, many festivities. And that closes my mayor's report. We do have uh, uh, some council reports. I'll start with Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as a liaison for the uh, Sydney North Sanitz RCMP Community Consultative Committee, um, this is uh, a news release put out by the RCMP just uh, for on June 30th, this Sunday, uh, they're going to be hosting their first community policing open house. It's going to be at the Mary Winspear Centre from 11 till 3 in the Bodine Hall. There will be booths uh, showcasing the volunteers that we have in our community, such as Block Watch, Citizens on Patrol, Sanitz Peninsula Restorative Justice, and PIMO Search and Rescue. The Royal Bank of Canada will also be there to meet and speak with community members about financial safety and fraud prevention. Uh, and Constable de Pass will have important senior safety tips there for members of our seniors community. For the families, there will be police-themed goodie bags for the first 150 kids and colouring books. A DJ with some music and kids can explore the police car and the police boat. I hope I get to be a kid. There will be an engraver to place identifying marks on bicycles, so please bring them down. And the bay doors will be open in the back parking lot. And you can meet a rider from the Tour de Rock, Cops for Cancer ride, who will be there uh, fundraising for that amazing cause. Um, and the Sanders Peninsula Lions Club uh, food truck will also be there for the whole event to provide food for people. So uh, take advantage of it. There will be some really good information for everybody and uh, pass it on to other people if they don't watch the video or are not present. Thank you. Councillor Duncan. All right, thanks. So um, I have two pieces uh, relating to water and climate change. Um, I'm the commissioner on the CRD Regional Water Commission. Uh, last, I guess June 14th, Friday before last, uh, a number of the commissioners and members of the Water Advisory Committee, members of the CRD board, we went and did a tour of the disinfection facilities to find out uh, what it takes to keep our water supply clean and potable. Um, so for those who have never been up for a tour before, you go the, on the bus and you go out to the, the reservoir, but we actually went in through the disinfection facilities, which are not very glamorous to look at. Um, but we learned we have a new liquid chlorine and ammonia facilities. So we have a kind of a three-step process. Starts with, we don't have any filtration. Our water comes straight and clean from the lake, goes through UV disinfection to get rid of parasites. Um, and it's liquid chlorine and then ammonia to create chloramines to keep it disinfected all the way out here to the end of the peninsula. And they have a number of stations along the way where they check that regularly to make sure that our water is still clean. So it's a bit of a process and we're all kind of in awe at the amount of gadgetry and technology it takes to keep our water like perfectly clean and not too many chemicals and just enough chemicals. Um, 
I learned that a few years ago the power went down for a week and it takes quite a bit of power to actually get potable water. So we now have a large backup generator. Um, so that shouldn't happen again. And a new thing that we have now for earthquake preparedness uh, was something they showed us that I put on my Facebook page, which is why I thought I should deliver a report. So I know there might be people who don't follow my Facebook page, um, is the new uh, emergency response trucks that they have. So these are stations that they can roll out if there is a breakage, um, an, er an earthquake or any anything else that stops the potable water from flowing. They can tie these things into these blue hydrants that you might start seeing around. There's one at Panorama. That's our emergency station for the peninsula. Um, and then they have bags of water that they can give out to residents or you can bring your own and, and they would load them up there. Um, right now, the CRD has trained people within their staff who operate these, but the hope is that eventually it will be very plug and play. There'll be a book and, you know, volunteers within municipalities and, um, you know, Pimo or, you know, Pamaran themselves can do it so that if there is a genuine emergency, trying to make sure we can get staff in from outer areas to run these things won't be a problem. There should be people always available wherever these things are, and that's part of um, their preparedness. Uh, in, in permanent stations like Panorama, um, there will be sea cans with all of the same stuff that will be up there, so we don't have to wait for a truck to come in. As long as we can have, get a volunteer out to the site, they can start operating um, water. So go to my Facebook, you can see a picture. <laughs> um, the other thing we were talking about was um, the drought levels and so at the meeting which was on this Wednesday June 19th um, we, we always look at our reservoir letter levels which are 92 percent we look really great we're at our regular level one drought level which just is the default that we start in May saying you know we start conserving water just to make sure we get through um, but many other places in BC on the island of course are level three and so one of the things we've been discussing is making sure that we are understanding our demand curves properly. Um, one thing I was really interested to learn was that the per capita water demand has been going down by about 1% a year due to the changing in efficient appliances. So as older building stock turn over and new building stock gets built and newer efficient appliances go in, um, our water conservation bylaws. So the demand curve per capita is going down. Of course, our population is going up. And so that's our biggest determinant right now is in drawing that. Um, and uh, home use is about 65% of the demand. Agriculture is only 3% and leaks are 8%. So when we were talking about agriculture use, we thought maybe we should kind of look at, at, at our leaks, even though that's really good. They look at 10% or less is considered a pretty tight system, um, that getting on top of our leaks rather than looking really hard at our agriculture use might be the thing to do. Uh, so the thing we also talked about was what happens if, was whether we've ever discussed what happens when the municipalities around us run out of water before we do, like Cowichan and Nanaimo, and they don't have water and we're sitting on a full reservoir. Have they, have we ever discussed with them whether they would ask for trucks, whether they would want to purchase water from us? Um, and no, it's never happened before, but now it's, it's something that we might start maybe seeing. Um, the opinion of staff was that it would be so cost prohibitive, it probably wouldn't be something they'd consider, but when you run out of water, um, which kind of leads into the climate change issue again, mm -hmm. is we don't filter our water. And so if we have a forest fire up around our reservoir, um, that would shut down our water. We would not be able to drink that water when it was contaminated with the ash and all the stuff flowing out of the, the forest. So we're looking at having to upgrade our system maybe. Um, <clears throat> and staff is having to look at the cost of that. And so fire suppression is a big deal and getting on top of that. And so one of the other commissioners is very, very into a vegetation management plan from the Highlands. He brought it forward to us before. So he brought it up again um, to some of us there asking if we talked about it. And I said that we, I had, had moved it um, to discuss and see what, what North Saanich was doing um, and, and asked, our Chief Mickelson, his opinion about does this look like something that would be uh, worth our while for, for Sydney to do. We don't have a large forest to manage and 
forest fires are not a big deal, but maybe interface fires from the North Saanich's surrounding land. And, and he said, yeah, if, if um, North Saanich uh, applied, that that might be something that we want to do. And so for those who may not have been in the audience when he brought this up, it's, it's um, let's see, the capital or the UBCM that um, funds this. It's a Community Resiliency Investment Program Strategic Wildfire Prevention Initiative. And there's up to $100,000 available for every, every municipality that joins it. So if everyone in the CRD joins it, then we could get up to $1.5 million to run a three-year research program in how to best fireproof our forests. Um, because of the cedar, cedar and Douglas fir die off, we're going to have more and more fuel loads building up in our forest. And so looking at ways to manage the die-off, figure out what the rates of die-off are, what rates of replanting we might need to do, and what species we might need to replant with. And now that the climate has changed and the species that we have are dying off. Um, so we've received a couple of letters in our agendas over the past few weeks from Oak Bay and Machosan saying that they've applied and encouraging others. I've heard Souk, they may have looked at it this week. Um, and the understanding that we were given was that North Saanich had, had said no to it. They were just going to go with their fire smart grants. But when um, Councillor Pearson followed up on it, she was going to make a motion on it. And staff advised her that they had, in fact, on February 4th, the North Saanich Council passed a motion to support the Strategic Wildfire Prevention Initiative and join in their co-application. So um, I would be prepared to make a motion following from what I've learned on my tours and talking to my colleagues that Sydney now join um, and write a letter to the Capital Regional District and all the other member local governments indicating that our council is also interested in participating in the co-application. And, uh, and hopefully if we're successful with that, that's another $100,000 that would go towards that research project for the Capital Region. We don't have to have forest, we just have to be a participating municipality. The CRD has already, CRD staff would be handling the application. Um, and they've already agreed that they're going, it's, it would be led a CRD staff initiative to manage it. If I could just ask a question and I'll go to other councillors. Um, a council will recall earlier in the year, um, six municipalities on the peninsula and into Victoria uh, came together and were co-applicants uh, for a child care needs assessment study. Uh, that provincial application was granted and so that's $150,000. Um, as part, as we learned while we were, while Sydney was um, uh, one of the six co-applicants, was that there had to be a main, uh, one of the municipalities had to be the one to receive the funds and coordinate the, uh, the spending of the funds in the study, of course, being done throughout the six municipalities. Having said that, my question is, is, is through your contacts, um, is there a municipality that is taking the lead in mm -hmm. terms of this co-application and, and uh, is there, what is the timeline uh, process? Yeah, it's this, the CRD has agreed to take the lead because, sorry, I, I should have glossed over. It's, um, it's open to municipalities and regional districts. So the regional district itself can be one of the co-applicants. And so my understanding is that the CRD itself the CRD staff were putting the application together. Okay, I'm, I'm just yeah, and and the, the deadline is October, so for everybody to have declared that they were going to be an applicant. Okay, uh, Councillor O'Keefe. So, I'm just trying to understand a bit more about the, the program and what the outcomes would be. So, is, there's a minimum number. Is there a minimum number? Of municipalities that have no okay no so, so I, well the minimum is one a, a, you oh. know a single one could apply and then they okay. get their hundred thousand but for each additional municipality that they that we get on board the pot of potential money goes up and so the bigger that the, the research program could be um, and so what what does he want to do I've actually got that um, yeah so I was wondering yeah so the CRD who's taking the lead on it have they drafted um, something in terms of what they would be, what they would be looking, yeah. looking at. So they're looking at three years. The first year is going to be um, researching the tree species die-off rates, 
Um, and then alternative, and then the second year we'll be looking at alternative species and testing management strategies for reducing fuel loads, um, replanting. And the third year, the outcome will be there will be a draft implementation plan for municipalities um, based on each municipality's conditions to manage their fuel loads and have the list of replacement species in their forests. So as part of, so that would be something that now that we have an urban forest strategy and we've one of our identified issues was identifying tree species that we can plant. This would be an actual outcome of this research project that we can plug into our urban forest strategy. Because if we are participating, we can help direct. Okay, would council like to make a motion? Sure. I move that council. Oh, thank you. I move that council direct staff to write a letter to the capital regional district and all member local governments indicating Council's interest in participating in a co-application submitted by the CRD on behalf of its members to UBCM's Community Resiliency Investment Program for the development of a regional vegetation management strategy. I'll second that. Further discussion? Uh, Councilor Rintoul. Just if I may, and this may be a learning opportunity for me, and I certainly appreciate the uh, the subject matter and, and the opportunity to participate, but you know, I, I, we've seen this previously uh, some time ago. I guess uh, I would have preferred the, the more fulsome approach to see the uh, the report. I don't know what implications there are from staff or f uh, for staff other than you know what's been explained here, uh, whether or not anything's been missed. Um, procedurally, would this not normally come as a notice of motion or something of that nature, where we have a chance to digest this further, or is this? This is how we would proceed with, uh, I just want to know what to expect moving forward. I don't know if that's a question to the chair or to staff, um, but procedurally, I find it a little awkward, although I like where it's going. Uh, I'll, I'll refer to, um, um, to Ms. Dunnick, our, our, our corporate, I mean, we do, I, th I think motions can come out of council reports, but in the case where additional information may be uh, requested by uh, council, we could certainly request that it be a notice of motion. Yeah, I would suggest that it uh, be made under notice of motion because this was not on the agenda. Council wasn't prepared to discuss the matter. So um, technically I would make a notice of motion so they have time to consider it and be placed on the next agenda. Yeah, okay, so we'll receive that as a notice of motion then. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. I don't believe there are any other reports. Uh, we'll move on to item 10. We have uh, the minutes from our uh, committee of the whole meeting of June 17th. I'll move that the, the minutes be received. Second. All those in favor? <coughs> Motion carries. And we have two recommendations. Um, I recommend that the Urban Forest Strategy Report by Barefoot Consulting, Consulting dated June 11th, be received, and that staff analyze the action items from the strategy and bring forward potential projects for consideration as part of annual fall strategic planning and subsequent budget process. Second. Discussion? I just want to add, I don't, we don't have to amend the motion, but I just want to add that uh, uh, currently in our strategic plan, the urban forest strategy is listed as one of the processes that we will um, be involved with with the strategic plan, or sorry, with the official community plan review, but uh, this is certainly uh, important. I'll call the question, all those in favor? Motion carries unanimous, thank you. The next item is uh, development variance permit application number DV100284, uh, 10326 Manaw Place relax setback requirements to allow an accessory structure in the rear yard. The application was referred to council from Committee of the Whole for a decision. And we have two options before us. Shall I recuse myself before you? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. <sighs> Councillor O'Keefe. I will move that owners and tenants in occupation of property within 75 meters, 246 feet of 10326 Minog Place, be notified regarding development variance permit application number DV100284 
and that any written correspondence received be forwarded to Council at the time of consideration of approval of the variance. Second. Discussion. Councillor Fallon. Thank you very much. Um, this one caused me some um, struggle in, in looking at how to go on the decision. Uh, there were merits on both sides of, um, of this particular argument. I was grateful to have the extra time that we uh, put the decision for this week, and I'm happy to support the motion. Councillor Wainwright. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also uh, found it useful to have the extra time to think this through. I think that council is unanimous that um, the property owner simply made an honest mistake uh, in um, starting construction of this uh, accessory building um, within the setback. And uh, it's, a, it's an expensive error to rectify. Um, it, um, it is something that if the, the, the structure is uh, made with non-combustible on that side, uh, it will comply with uh, building code requirements. Uh, it's not a massive uh, kind of variance. It's a relatively small variance. Um, I uh, appreciate the uh, discussion we had about um, how the circumstances and how it came about. Um, and uh, there was a suggestion uh, that there might be shared blame and that a solution might be that uh, uh, the accessory building be moved and, and the town uh, split the cost. Um, I think that, uh, you know, given that it was an honest mistake, uh, it would be expensive and inappropriate um, for the town to share in the cost of, uh, of remedying that mistake when there's an easier fix and that's just granting the variance. Um, I don't find this variance um, that major and uh, on balance, I'm, I'm willing to uh, see the variance granted rather than uh, require, um, you know, several thousand dollars of effort to fix a relative, an honest mistake um, that is uh, not of major consequence. Councillor Rintoul. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Likewise, um, I, I concur. I think we all probably struggled with, with this one and sympathize with the scenario. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, that theme that offense is not a uh, legal property line uh, should probably uh, be driven home to, to everyone, um, not just those of us in this room. Happens all over the province, unfortunately, on a regular basis. Uh, I'm really happy with the suggestions here. We get to hear from uh, from local residents with respect to feedback if they have any, and give this some uh, further consideration. So I'll support the motion. Thank you, uh, Councillor Garnett. Yeah, I think similar to what's already been said. Um, this, this is just was a really difficult one, and, and as I said at the previous meeting, I, I, I honestly believe you acted in good faith, and it's just a, a misunderstanding, miscommunication, whatever have you. But uh, I, I don't think the owner, sh owner should fall on you f for all of that. So I, I agree that we should move forward with this. And I mean, if there's people that have a real problem with it, then we may have to revisit it. But uh, we'll let the let your neighbors tell us what they think. Thanks. Councillor O'Keefe. I'm just going to say I think it's a, a good <clears throat> learning experience for all of us and anybody else listening in terms of where property lines are. I know um, I bought my house 20 years ago and I've had a nice flower bed on one side until the neighbor decided to uh, tear down the house and build a new house and the property line wasn't where I thought it was and so I lost part of my flower bed but it just you know um, the over time, you know, that was a house that it was built in the 70s. A lot of these houses, the pins are now missing. And so it's not always um, easy to see where the property line is. So you move into a house and you assume, oh, that, that looks like it. But um, I guess it's good to be vigilant as we see some of these older houses, um, you know, having modifications done or fences built or accessory buildings to to be making sure uh, ahead of time that you know we're taking a look at those things. Without any further discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? The motion carries unanimous. Thank you. 
We'll now move to staff reports and, sir, yeah, let's uh, bring our good counselor back. Thank you. We'll now move to uh, item 11A, the Sydney Housing Needs Assessment Project. Do we have a report dated from staff uh, June 18th? I'll move that the consulting contract for the Sydney Housing Needs Assessment Project be awarded to Urban Matters CCC. Second. Uh, discussion? Councillor O'Keefe and Councillor Rintoul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, first I'd like to say that um, I like the um, the the layout and the logical approach uh, proposed in the, the way ahead for this. Um, some of the other things that I liked um, is the, uh, the opportunity for capacity building for town staff and other stakeholders for developing and uh, using housing needs assessments like lunch and learns and workshops. So I think that was sort of some of the things that might be under consideration. So just my comments to staff that I think those are good things to follow up on. I also liked, uh, there was an option for a midpoint uh, update to council, so I support that and I think that's a good idea. Um, in regards to the data collection and cleanup, um, so I was really happy to see that this is going to include an updated demographic and economic profile of Sydney. And I'd been thinking that that was something that we should be doing um, once we reconvene our economic advisory committee so it's good to see that um, the province I guess will be paying for that because we get funding uh, for this housing needs assessment um, I also note from the project um, timeline that it looks like they're targeting to have that done uh, by July 8th um, so I was wondering whether um, that was information that we might be able to access um, prior to the a final completion of the report that we could pass along to our new economic advisory committee for review. Um, so just a request or comment in regards to that. Um, also they talked about uh, collecting information on housing tenure like ownership, rentals, and so I'm wondering if that would also include the number of legal uh, secondary suites and, and an estimate on illegal ones, so through you, Mr. Mayor, to staff. Okay, and um, I guess another question, sort of related to that, um, when they're talking about demand and supply determinants, um, uh, you know, the things that would impact vacancy rates, I'm wondering whether they would be looking at the impact of short-term rentals on the supply of rental housing, um, whether staff would have info on that to provide them as part of the report. Okay. Uh, so it's something we'd be looking at. Uh, just because the information is out there, it's available. Again, uh, our estimates and their, I believe, reasonable estimates. Um, I don't know what to what degree they'd be able to drill down to detail just to the town of Sydney, but it's certainly something they'd be looking at. Okay. And just a couple other things, if I if I may. Um, in terms of the engagement strategy, I, I like that they're looking to uh, try and get uh, a lot of other uh, groups and young families and that sort of thing. Um, other, other groups that I hope would be on the list is um, capturing people with who have accessibility issues uh, and also capturing input from people who don't live here but might want to. So I'm, I'm 
I guess a question to staff through you, Mr. Mayor, whether there's any in the anything in the strategy um, that would facilitate that. So I'm thinking about, say, people who live or who work in Sydney, um, but they don't they don't live here, but they would like to. So whether part of the engagement strategy um, would facilitate those people participating. Yeah, that would be good. That was on my list, West Side. And then finally, um, Mr. Mayor, do we know how and when North Saanich is proceeding with their housing needs analysis? And would we be planning to meet with them at some point to sort of to compare or share notes and uh, potential strategies? Would staff have a comment on I, I'm sorry, I'm unaware of, oh, of, okay. of the process in, in North Saanich. Yeah, if I can, uh, I, think, I, think, uh, I think Mr. Newton's uh, talked to the planning staff about their, I guess, what stage North Saanich is at with respect to their housing needs uh, assessment and the potential, I guess, for collaboration opportunities. Yeah, so uh, I've had a discussion with North Saanich uh, because they're required in advance of an OCT Okay, I just thought it would be, there might be an opportunity, for example, if, if we're looking to do a survey of people working on the west side, which might also include North Saanich uh, businesses in the industrial area to capture those people who are commuting. So rather than us doing a survey and them doing a survey. One of the things we're looking at Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rintoul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, if I may, uh, to staff, um, with respect to the report and the reference uh, uh, to the planning staff review of the uh, RFP uh, proposals that were received, what, what sort of, Corey, what sort of level of uh, uh, consideration was given to uh, Barefoot Planning's involvement uh, in this uh, proposal from Urban Matters? Uh, through the Mayor to Councillor Rintoul, uh, virtually none. Um, I believe his involvement uh, as part of that group is, is quite minimal. Um, we looked at strictly the technical proposal, uh, the qualitative and quantitative aspects of that proposal related to the other proposals. Um, the people involved had no bearing on them. Uh, the uh, cover letter notes that uh, Barefoot Planning and Design has a long and valued history of working with the town. Uh, they also make a point of noting that uh, they feel there's no conflict of interest uh, on this project. I'm assuming that means with respect to Evan Peterson, who's you know just completed or uh, continues to have some responsibility in association with the urban forest strategy. Um, what other uh, works? Has Barefoot or um, Evan Peterson done recently uh, for the town? Uh, again, through the mayor to Councillor Rintoul, um, the list is fairly long actually. Uh, the downtown waterfront vision, um, West Side local area plan, uh, density, study. density study from 2015. Uh, so he's done quite a few projects. Uh, the comment on the conflict of interest in the proposal 
is actually a response, I believe, to a requirement in the RFP requiring that they state that there's no conflict of interest. Um, I don't think it has any specific reference to Mr. Peterson. Uh, if I may, Mr. Moore, is his uh, contractual arrangement concluded then with regard to the urban forest strategy? Yes, it is. So he currently has no other contracts open with the town? Not to my knowledge. Okay, I do have some slight concern with the, uh, um, I understand clearly the efficiency and the value of having someone who's been involved in party to uh, the types of projects that you referred to. Um, but I'm also, um, without having the benefit of understanding of uh, the depth of Barefoot, uh, the involvement of, of partners uh, or others in the undertaking to see you know, the same individual uh, time and time again participating in studies of this nature. Yeah, through the mayor to Councillor Rinto, if I could just respond to that. Um, my belief is that uh, the main consultant, Urban Matters, uh, probably included Mr. Peterson in the project because uh, they believe there's a relationship and they think that, they may, that we value that relationship. Uh, to be honest, in evaluating this, these proposals, um, that was, for me, uh, a bit of a strike against Urban Matters in that uh, Mr. Peterson doesn't have a lot of background in housing issues like this. And for me, um, in evaluating these proposals, he didn't bring a lot to the table. Um, and again, you know, in terms of a technical basis for this, uh, I don't think there was really any benefit. Um, and his consideration was discounted. Yeah, um, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. And I, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Newcomb, that I don't think in this case it, it brings a lot of value to the proposal. In fact, you know, I have a concern with it. Um, uh, I would uh, encourage, uh, the, the proposal is fulsome. Um, there's, there seems to be a reference to, uh, to Barefoot's role as being a sub-consultant. Um, my suggestion to staff would be that you, you know, thoroughly understand what his contribution is and, and whether or not he has the opportunity you know, to shape the report. And this is not meant to discredit Barefoot at all. The reality is I think we need to see some, uh, some variety in terms of the professional input and the guidance that we're seeking when we go out for, for these proposals. And so I take uh, you know, your comments uh, you know, as they're intended to illustrate um, that clearly uh, urban matters uh, you know, are the driving force behind this and that rightly or wrongly they felt that this might you know, help their proposal uh, and that as a sub-consultant, we're not looking at any segment of the work that's you know, significant. But I would like staff to please be uh, you know, uh, aware of the concern I've stated because I, I think he's had, uh, Barefoot has had a lot of uh, involvement in the town uh, and I take it for good reason. Obviously there's been a competitive process. Uh, the work has been awarded. Uh, but then I think we have a responsibility to watch and ensure that we're getting some sort of balanced perspective as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Duncan and Councillor, uh, sorry, Councillor Garnett and Councillor Duncan. Yeah, I, I think the proposal is an, an excellent one, but I, I have to admit I agree with uh, Councillor Rintoul. I had the same reservations. I was thinking actually almost the exact same thoughts that uh, the, the same name occurring, what it looks like in terms of from the outside looking in and and subcontracting, I, I think your your concerns are valid, and um, I would just sort of like to echo that to staff that that is some concern that I have also with the same, same within the same context. So thanks. Thanks. I had also had that as my first point. Um, it is something the concern about the fact that we have one consultant who does much of the contract work for Sydney was something that was actually brought up to me on the campaign trail, so it was not lost on the public, and I'm assuming that Councillor Rintoul had heard similar things. Um, however, I also think this is a great proposal and that staff has probably accurately assessed which one is the best and the best value. And having come from probably, a, a, the proposal looks very similar in structure and in approach to what I would have done as a consultant, only an entirely different field. And so I know that the addition of Evan is something we, we would have 
done in our capacity as consultants as well, where if we didn't have a pre-existing relationship with the client, we look and we see, well, who, what consultant do they usually use? What consultant do they frequently use? Who knows them? And then we put them on as a senior advisor, right? And then when you've written your report, you have your, your technical your technical reviewer who is more senior than whoever wrote it and they check and make sure it's technically accurate and then you have your senior person who may know nothing about the technical field whatsoever but they know your client and they know what type of reports you the, the client likes to see and and what how it fits with the client's general approach to things and so they read it simply for looking at it as the first set of your client's eyes going on it before you actually send it to your client yourself. So from that approach, as I read it, I went, okay, I see what they've done here. Ah, oh, clever consultants. Well, this is the background that they've done. So what, I, and I don't know that we can really influence that much, but I would hope that it means he's not building a lot of hours and that the amount we're spending on this contract isn't for him to sit on every conference call. Sometimes people pull in their senior reviewer too frequently and that he really does just have, as you say, kind of that minor role right at the end and that we're not paying more for a non-expert who people are starting to feel kind of hourly about to, to build lots of hours. Um, my second thing was just, uh, I know that their, their list of references that they would include in their literature review is not complete at the proposal stage, but I'm hoping that they would also include the 2017 State of the Child Report when they're looking at demographic <laughs> forecast um, because I know they, kind of looked at it specifically from that youth angle and the 300 babies added to the Saanich Peninsula every year are going somewhere and I don't know if that's something you'll get from um, StatsCan um, and, and specific probably qualitative assessments about the infrastructure needs that those people are looking for around their housing might be useful for them. Um, and anecdotally, um, looking at the people who are moving in, one of the things we've been talking about as we add housing supply is that as we add condominiums, hopefully people who are in single family houses will then, as they age out, they no longer have families, move into the condos, younger families move in. And when I was campaigning, that was actually something I was starting to see in the people who answered the doors was people who were like that older, millennial, younger Gen X who said, yeah, I grew up in this house. My parents just moved out. They moved into a condo and now I live in the house. And I came back here after living somewhere else to raise my family. And so it stuck in my mind, and, I, and, and of course I have absolutely no idea how representative that was and how much it just stuck in my mind because I thought, wow, you moved back into the house you grew up in, that's interesting. Um, and how many people I know who are also adding extensions onto their houses um, or, or doing a suite because their parents are going to move back into the family home with them, but in the suite, and they're taking over the house. And so I'm hoping that they can somehow get back at, get, get an idea of, of um, how much that is actually, that, that movement into the condos of the older generations and then the younger generations being able to take it over that um, is coming through because I don't know if they're not doing official sales through a realtor, it's just they're moving back in. We would kind of miss that and it might be interesting to know. So that was everything. Sorry, if, if I could just uh, one more comment on uh, Mr. Pearson's involvement. Um, so staff, uh, when we sat down with the proposals, uh, I guess partially anticipating this uh, feedback, uh, we sort of chuckled and said, you know, uh, should we discount this uh, proposal completely because of, of his involvement and decided that no, you know, to let's give all these a fair shake. and. Um, and this is the one that came out on top. So it, it really had nothing to do with Mr. Peterson. Uh, his hourly involvement in the overall project is quite small. And again, we sort of discounted, uh, and exactly for the, uh, for the reasons that Councillor Duncan stated, we assumed it was sort of a, you know, get uh, more awareness of, uh, of our team as opposed to the seven other teams. Any further discussion? I'll call the question, all those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. I'll now move to item 11B, uh, which is a request for removal of a protected tree at 2027 Melville Drive. We have a report from staff dated June 14th. I'll move the recommendation that the request for the removal of a tree of heaven tree located in the rear yard of 2027 Melville Drive be denied. Second. Discussion? Councillor Gunnett? 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I did a site visit yesterday and uh, no work crews, Councillor O'Keefe, so I was able to actually go and look at the tree. Um, and yeah, I agree with their, our assessment. It's a very healthy looking tree. Um, watched a bird in there eating bugs, watched a squirrel at the very top just sort of hanging out and resting and thinking, oh, this tree's obviously valuable to the animal life in the neighborhood. Um, I did note that uh, the protection fencing had fallen down on the backside, which I thought was a bit odd. I thought it would be a better effort of keeping that up. Um, there's ivy, English ivy growing on it. I would like to see that removed for sure. Um, that would is definitely going to lead to the detriment of the tree in the long term. Some kind of rope tied in the middle. I'm not sure if that's from a previous owner or whatever. Uh, the tree itself, um, I honestly can't see a reason to take it down, especially when we just had the urban forest strategy in here and um, and how much the canopy we have, and we don't want to be losing a canopy when a tree is healthy. So um, I will definitely be supporting to deny this. Other comments? Uh, Councillor Duncan. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm um, the... The arborist calls it the tree of heaven, and, and here it is called the tree of heaven. However, on all of their drawings and the petition that they got the neighbors to sign, they refer to it as a black walnut. Confirm it is, in fact, a tree of heaven. Do we? Okay, without further discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. We'll now move to item 11C, the signage proposal from Artsy Gallery, the building at Tolista Park. We have a report uh, dated June 18th from staff. I'll uh, move the recommendation that the Artsy Community Arts Council be authorized to install two fascia signs, one temporary sign, one low mount freestanding sign, one window sign, and one sandwich board sign on the property located at 9565 Fifth Street subject to the following condition one that rc community arts council contact the parks department to inspect the low mount freestanding sign installed in the garden bed to ensure the health and long-term well-being of the adjacent ornamental conifer will not be affected by the placement or installation of the sign second uh, discussion Councillor O'Keefe. thank you mr mayor um so i went and i i i visited the uh the gallery and looked at the signs and personally I think um, it looks cluttered I'm not in favor of all the signs I think it's too I think it's too much however they appear to comply with the bylaw so I don't think aside from my personal opinion that I think it's too much signs and it's too cluttered um, I, uh, I I, th I think the, uh, the the uh, motion should proceed anyways. Councillor Garnett. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor to staff, ha have the parks been consulted and gone on and looked yet at the tree and the sign, the freestanding sign? Can anybody answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Rotating <laughs> seats. <laughs> through the Mayor to Councillor Garnet, no, I don't believe they have. Okay, because I, I, when looking at it yesterday, it seemed I'm okay with it, but I would like to. I know it's part of the recommendation, and you have to make sure it is. But I, I could see them definitely moving the sign forward away from the tree and probably being okay, but I will definitely wait to hear back from what uh, staff and their uh, knowledge base tells us. So I'm, I'm okay with moving ahead with it. Sorry, just for clarification, what was the question, Councillor Gurney? Whether staff had actually already been out to look at the freestanding sign and, and the, the parks department? In, in in regards to the freestanding sign in but in regards to, to the tree there the part of the thing is to part of the motion number one is to make sure that the, the sign leaves enough room for the tree and i wonder if they'd already been out to look at it because the sign is installed already so i was just curious to see if they'd actually had a look at it okay so. sorry I, I missed the point thank you uh, any other discussion uh just a comment i'm, I'm in support of this resolution i appreciate uh from council's last resolution requesting staff to go back and discuss that uh, the proposal is uh, altered significantly uh, and there are fewer signs uh, but just a comment uh, i do think uh, on the south side uh, which includes the main entrance there is uh, uh, there's the eight foot sign above the map boards there's the six or eight foot sign uh, vertically or vertically uh, in front of the tree uh, then there's signs on either small signs an open sign and a gallery sign on either side of the front door and then just to the left of that on the railing will be a seasonal sign, which is another six or eight feet. 
Um, and so if there was one sign to reduce that, uh, it would be the large side in front of the tree. It would be nice to, to see the tree, and I think there's sufficient, just personal opinion, I think there's sufficient signing elsewhere uh, for that, but uh, those are just comments. Um, I'll call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? We have one opposed, the motion carries. Uh, item 11D, uh, Fire Engine Squad 1 replacement, a report from staff dated June 4th. I'll move that the replacement of Squad 1 for amount not exceeding $200,000 Canadian be advanced in the financial plan by a year to 2019. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, Councilor Rintoul. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, to Chief Mickelson, if I may. Um, Chief, I think you note here that um, it may be unlikely that you don't get the whole wish list uh, that's here with respect to the budget that uh, is allocated uh, and that there may be some give and take uh, on the assumption that you do manage uh, to get um, a replacement vehicle which has the uh, capacity to carry uh, foam and a foam discharge system. Um, when training on with that unit and with when training on the discharge of that foam, uh, what facilities are in place for, for uh, the recovery of that in the new uh, community safety building uh, and, and sort of the handling of, uh, of that product once it's been discharged in a training environment? Through the mayor to Councillor Rintoul, the, the foams we use presently are nothing like the foams we used even 10 or 15 years ago. They're an animal-based protein foam, so there is, uh, there's virtually no negative effects to the environment. So it's, it's nothing like, they're not uh, the PFOS foams that were, for example, that were used 20 years ago. So there is no effect, negative effect to the environment. So they, it, it just runs off. Thank you. Uh, do you uh, currently train with foam on, on another apparatus or on the vehicle that this would be replacing? We do train on foam, but primarily the vast majority of the foam train that takes place is with our Marina Fire Protection Trailer. Okay. So it's to suppress uh, heavy fuel, then I take it? Well, correct. The, definitely the, the squad apparatus is primarily tasked with uh, vehicle fires. And obviously, uh, there's a fuel-laden event. So for that reason, we want to have the ability to lay down a foam blanket if required. Understood. Thank you. Other comment? Uh, I just have a, a brief comment. Uh, I appreciate the detail from the chief in terms of the um, the... Um, the um, facilities on the vehicle uh, and the discussion with regards to a cost of from 175 to 200,000, uh, and that uh, those there are sufficient funds in the uh, in the capital reserve to uh, to do this uh, this uh, this procurement at the uh, $200,000 level. So, further discussion, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Move to item 11E, we have the Shaw Centre Energy Supply Agreement Renewal and a report from staff dated June 17th. I'll move that the Energy Supply Agreement with Sydney Pier Geothermal Utility Court be renewed for an additional five year term. Second. Discussion? Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, a question uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to staff. I'm wondering if we know um, how much of an increase is this from prior years? So the annual cost now will be 35,036. And there was some comment that the, the center felt that that was quite a significant uh, increase. So I'm just wondering if we know what, what amount of increase that was. So I'd asked this question actually earlier. Unfortunately, the letter writer of the report, uh, Andrew, uh, isn't here. But uh, okay. it's my understanding that there there is no increase uh, from years past. It's just been the annual increase that uh, that has taken it to this current amount. Okay. Um, so we're not seeing a significant increase above the the last agreement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, also, on Schedule A, it outlines geothermal equipment such as pumps and miscellaneous fittings and things. And so I guess I don't 
have enough knowledge to know whether um, I know that the, the center has been uh, replacing a lot of uh, pumps and fittings and different things so whether this is relates to those things or whether this is very specific to the geothermal facility if I can through the, through the mayor to council keep this is very specific to the okay. geothermal utility um, I've seen the geothermal uh, utility room in uh, in the uh, in the hotel that it, uh, it uh, it's akin to the Starship Enterprise. It's it's pretty sophisticated <laughs> stuff and uh, and 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 quite expansive. So very very different. Okay, and then my last question is: so it mentions that under town's responsibilities, um, that the town or its tenant shall enter into a maintenance contract with a qualified energy engineering firm um, and notify the utility in the event of any defects or problems in the operation of the town system. So I'm just wondering how has that requirement been addressed? Yeah, that I can't speak to. We'd have to, we would have to look into that, uh, Councillor O'Keefe, and, uh, and uh, perhaps get back to you at a later date regarding that. I don't have the answer right now. Okay. Yeah. So just, um, you know, we did have some concerns with some of the maintenance issues at the Shaw Center. I know mm -hmm. they're starting to address those, so I don't know if if this particular thing is covered under what they're currently doing or not. So since it isn't part of the agreement, it would be good to maybe for us to double check. As I, 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 I don't believe it's... As I understand yeah. it, the geothermal it's very system separate. is completely separate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, but it does say that it's our responsibility to enter into a maintenance contract with a qualified energy engineering firm. So I presume it sounds to me that's under 2.3 in the agreement. So yeah, I'm just yeah. wanting to make sure that we've done the things that we're supposed to do. Yeah, I, again, without getting into too much detail, I, you know, anything, I believe that's entirely on the sort of Shaw connection side. So again, it has nothing to do with the, uh, I don't think it has anything to do with uh, with uh, the um, the agreement uh, for the uh, for the actual utility. Okay, I just I guess I just need some clarity, just because because the agreement says that that we shall it doesn't say maybe it said we shall enter into a maintenance contract with a qualified energy engineering firm. Okay, we'll look into it and, yeah. uh, and report back. Okay. Yeah, I think we've got our answer from yep. staff. Okay, thanks. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Thank you. I just had a quick question. <clears throat> I don't know that it makes any difference. I, I believe what Councillor O'Keefe was mentioning was was that they that the Ocean Discovery Center had said it seemed high relative to their energy needs, which made me wonder. So we have a f it's it's a flat rate fee. We that they that it's just a price. It's not like for an amount of like this many gigajoules or giga I don't know kilowatts of gigawatts of energy. Um, so is it just like they they just this is how much you're gonna pay regardless of the amount of energy we give you. We just feed you as much energy as we get. I know they have other customers, so I'm just wondering what the how they decide how much energy that buys. And, and it seems like if they put in a bunch of stuff to conserve energy and they still end up paying the same amount, is it for the same amount of energy? Because it says it's indexed to the, to, to, uh, cons it's to the consumer price index. And it doesn't seem to mention how, that it varies based on how much energy is actually consumed or produced. I'm just wondering how, how it works. Yeah, we had, um, the mayor and I had actually uh, uh, spoke with uh, Mr. Hissick about this. And so he's the one that did the negotiation uh, with, uh, with, um, with uh, um, the uh, utility corp uh, on this. So there is no real way to, to, to sort of measure uh, uh, the amount of, I guess, energy that's going through. And so it is, it is, a, it is, a, it is a flat fee system. Uh, unfortunately, there's nothing also to compare, compare what uh, their, uh, their potential um, energy needs would be if it was an HVAC system, for example, a uh, traditional HVAC system. So, uh, so unfortunately, there's no way to absolutely compare on this. And, and just a, a short additional comment is that um, uh, while there is no, uh, no um, it's not known how much ener alternate energy would be required in terms of units of electricity or, or what have you. 
um, quite frankly, in the design of the center and the space that was provided, mm -hmm. uh, uh, space for HVAC is, is very challenging or providing HVAC, traditional HVAC throughout the facility was going to be very challenging and given that uh, they had this geothermal plant uh, and they, were, they are operating as a utility, as it says in the agreement, uh, that through the negotiation we can see how that utility is operating and charging and uh, it seems to be fair relative to what uh, other users of the utility are, uh, are, are paying, mm -hmm. so. Okay, any further questions or discussion? I'll call the question, all those in favor? The motion carries unanimous, thank you. We'll now move to our, uh, item 11F, the sta uh, 2018 Statement of Financial Information, also known as SOFI, report dated June 17th. I'll move the recommendation that Council approves the statement of financial information for the Town of Sydney for the year ended December 31st, 2018. Second. Discussion? I'll call a question. All those in favour? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. I'll now move to item F, item 11F, the Torque Masters Car Show event. We have a report uh, dated June 18th from staff. I'll move that the Torque Masters Car Club be authorized to close the following streets and public parking lots. Beacon Avenue from 5th Street to 1st Street, Beacon Avenue from 1st Street to Beacon Wharf, 4th Street from Sydney Avenue to Bevan Avenue, 3rd Street from Sydney Avenue to Bevan Avenue, 2nd Street from Beacon Avenue to Bevan Avenue if needed, Lot C, 4th Street at Sydney Avenue, and Lot F, 3rd Street at Bevan Avenue from 5 a.m. to 4 p.m on Sunday, August 11th, 2019, to accommodate vehicles for their car show event, subject to the following conditions. A, that the club provide the town with proof of $5 million minimum liability insurance, indemnifying the town of any liability. B, that certified traffic control persons be utilized where identified by the town. C, that the event be undertaken in compliance with all town bylaws. D, that the center of each Closed street and intersections remain clear of any obstructions to allow emergency vehicles immediate access. E, that the club provide and maintain temporary toilet facilities with hand washing amenities for the duration of the event. The number and locations of these facilities to be approved by the town. F, that the club provide all emergency services, including BC Ambulance, with written notification of the event and meet with them four weeks prior to the event to address any concerns. G, that the club provide BC Transit with written notification of the event. H, that the club arrange a written agreement with the PCS addressing key coordination issues, scheduling and procedures for ending the car show as to not disrupt P PCS's concert event. I, that the club send out notices to all businesses, residents fronting on streets to be closed advising of the event and that access to their properties will be maintained if so required and provide them with contact numbers should there be any concerns questions at least four weeks prior to the event and j that the town provide sponsorship for the event in the amount of a thousand dollars in in-kind services and the club reimburse the town for all costs above this amount second discussion uh, Councillor Rintoul. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, for starters, I, I want to acknowledge that uh, obviously it's, a, it's been an event that's been held here uh, and adds to the atmosphere and certainly the vibrancy of, of uh, the town of Sydney. Uh, uh, it's been well received. Uh, question uh, to staff. Um, first off, uh, I am pleased to see uh, the, the reference here to uh, additional uh, temporary toilet facilities and again a large event you know it's probably prudent that we uh, go ahead and do that uh, question through the staff is had we previously made that request of this event through the mayor to uh, Councillor Rintoul I don't believe the request has been made in the past how we're talking with the club organizer they have in past provided uh, washroom facilities at uh, some locations Okay, thank you, and and uh, good on the club for doing that because obviously the 
the demand at a couple of locations around town would be uh, very high for an event as well attended as this. Uh, so when giving consideration to the final financial implications of reducing uh, the amount of sponsorship uh, that this motion has uh, requested based on the staff recommendation, uh, the addition of, of portable washrooms then is not affecting the club's uh, budget per se. They've, they've done this in past uh, and they obviously intended to do it again, I assume, without the reference here. Um, I do note, uh, you know, that the club, uh, you know, seemingly has not used the full allotment of the $2,500 that had been sponsored uh, or pr provided previously. Uh, you know, I'm certainly want to see uh, any concern the club may have that they've, you know, perhaps been caught off guard by this change or don't have the capacity to address this uh, change. I would be concerned with. Um, I, I, I like the reference that I saw in the staff note previously, uh, as I understood it, that it was an up to twenty-five hundred dollars, whereas the current wording is uh, a sponsorship for the event in the amount of one thousand uh, in-kind uh, services, and so. Um, that latitude isn't there uh, any longer from the standpoint that perhaps we uh, offered $2,500 previously and they didn't use it all. Um, so we didn't, uh, you know, look to intend to uh, provide it in kind. Um, I want to uh, encourage this. I, I'd be comfortable uh, proposing an amendment to the $1,000 amount. Well, I, I'm appreciative of staff suggestion, certainly. Uh, but to test the waters on this particular point, uh, I'd like to move an amendment uh, to the amount that's indicated uh, under item J uh, from 1,000 to uh, not to exceed $2,000 in kind services. If there's a seconder for that. I consider it a friendly amendment. As a friendly amendment? I don't know if the seconder is comfortable with that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have uh, we have the amount changed uh, in item J to, sorry, uh, uh, Councilor Rintoul, so up to, you're changing not only the amount, but uh, changing it not in the amount, but up to the amount? Correct. Thank you. Not to exceed. Councilor O'Keefe, uh, go ahead. So I, I might have, considered um, voting in favor of the motion if it had been at a thousand um, but I have difficulty approving the one for three thousand uh, I guess the the things that I'm looking at is I'm noting staff's comments um, that this is has been the only annual event that receives a waiver of town costs except for peninsula celebrations or artsy and some one-time events um, I'm also thinking about, you know, the process we went through with the grant and aids. We had almost three dozen very good uh, community organizations and events and uh, that were looking for funds in the amount of $75,000. They all took the time to participate in that process. They submitted financial statements. Um, they talked about the benefit to the town. They showed, uh, well, not in all cases, but in, uh, some sort of financial need. And so I see a lot of that um, lacking in, in this proposal. Um, I think it's something, you know, and we have these sort of discussions during our grants in kind discussion about um, organizations that come back year after year. And there should be, I think, some expectation that something that's been taking place for seven years should be self-sustainable by this time. Um, <coughs> So I'm willing to, I would have been willing to support the motion uh, for 1,000 and then look to be phasing it out for next year. Um, but I'm not in favor of supporting a, a, a 2,000. I mean, I, I feel like we're doing a disservice and we're not being fair to other groups in the community. So that's kind of what's uh, top of my mind as I look at this. Okay, we have four other councillors uh, to speak. Councillor Duncan, Councillor Garnett, Councillor Rintoul, and Councillor Fallon. Councillor Duncan? Um, 
I think I had some of the misgivings that Councillor Rintoul shared about the worrying that we'd pull the rug under out from under a, an organization that expected this this money and, and has for for many years. Um, though I note that the club is sitting in the back, and I'm guessing they had the agenda before and had probably seen this change in that discussion and didn't come forward during public participation, which I was kind of think, looking to see if, if anyone would come forward during public participation to, to note that they'd noticed that change and that wouldn't be workable. And, and since they didn't, I kind of thought, well, maybe they were kind of prepared for that and, and haven't. So, um, and, and kind of thought, yeah, we, we can handle that. So I, <clears throat> hopefully they read it ahead of time and I'm not just making that assumption. But so, so I, I feel like given the success of this program, it's hard on the one hand, this, it's, it's such a successful show. Uh, you, you want to, to support it as much as you can. On the other hand, it is so successful it probably does bring in enough money by now to be able to to start being self-sustaining. And, and I would, as Councillor O'Keefe brought up, um, like to see what other things we can start supporting. We have so many requests with that money, so. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Councillor Garnett? A question through you, Mayor, uh, to, to staff. Um, looking at the uh, sort of grid here, and if it's Sydney Beer Garden, what exactly does that incorporate? Do they have like an outside, outside the end of it's in the parking lot or is it in the building? Through the mayor to uh, Councillor Garnett, um, I confirmed with them that uh, the uh, beer garden is an indoor event this year. Okay, and did, so I'm assuming the proceeds go to the, to the end of it's then or do we know what that, how that works? My understanding is, yeah, it's their, their event. Okay. Okay, as long as it's inside, I'm all good with that. Um, I also have the same concerns that uh, Councillor O'Keefe uh, brought up, reading what the staff was saying uh, in terms of phasing out. And so I was actually came to the, the meeting tonight thinking I, I'd be in favor of phasing it out tonight, but I'm willing to uh, go along with the initial recommendation of $1,000 of $1, um, and then phasing out just to give them time to adjust to having it not be there in the future. So. Uh, I, again, I'd be in favor of the original motion, not the one that's been amended. Okay, we have Councillor Rintoul. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's first uh, by way of process. Um, essentially, it hasn't been amended. It's, it was a, deemed as a friendly amendment. And so if we defeat this, uh, I don't know that there's a mechanism to bring it back. Uh, so we would need to visit the prospect of... Uh, of uh, returning to the original motion that's here at risk of this uh, organization uh, losing all support from the town, which is certainly not um, anyone's intent up here. Uh, look, I mean, it's been you know, going on since 2013. Uh, really, it's just in my mind, you know, the uh, opportunity for them to hear what council's thoughts are. The suggestion in the staff report, uh, you know, was around phasing it out and uh, considering a policy whereby town financial support is only provided as seed funding for new events and I like that suggestion I like heading in that direction uh, but obviously we're not there tonight I would have preferred to see the group um, retain you know close to a level of financial support from the town that they had received previously at the two thousand uh, dollar level of where previously it was twenty five hundred dollars as a step towards that and the message uh, being received to you know members of the club who are here I also note that um, you know they they do good things with the money that uh, that uh, comes in if there's surplus and, and the references uh, that were made to uh, supporting um, scholarships etc uh, in automotive programs in particular for students and so uh, I'm not uncomfortable uh, you know offering the additional funds in terms of sponsorship to this particular event with that aspect of their program in mind uh, and I'm still supportive of it but I'm, I'm, I'm leery of proceeding with the, the uh, friendly amendment if we're at risk of losing all funds. So I would, would rather see this uh, as a procedural comment there. Mm. Uh, I would suggest that that not be a friendly amendment and that you vote on the amendment. Yeah, and I, that was the initial intent and I appreciate the willingness for the friendly amendment, but if the amended uh, motion fails we can still go back to the 1000 and so if, if so i'll consider sure. that uh, we have a motion 
uh, in the amount of one thousand dollars. And now, uh, if you're proposing an amendment, Councillor Garnett will look, or Councillor uh, Rintoul will look for a seconder of that amendment. Second. Okay. Any further discussion on the amendment, Councillor? Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm yeah, confused about <laughs> okay, um, Ms. Dunnick, if you can just clarify what we're processing. So it looks as though Mr. Rintoul now has made the amendment to not to exceed $2,000. Councillor Wainwright has um, seconded it, so that's where we're at, to amend it to say <coughs> not to exceed $2,000. So if the, motion, if the amended motion is defeated, then, then we will still have the main motion at the original 1000 if the motion if the amendment passes then the, mo the main motion will be changed to reflect that so i'm going to go to um uh councillor fallot if you wish to speak on on the amendment please not on the main motion no i'll speak to the amendment um I in regards to the funds um as councillor uh, duncan noted the proponent had an opportunity to speak at public participation, so I think the $1,000 uh, was within their plan. I also note their uh, letter that they have submitted that they provide bursaries, so clearly uh, they do have funds left over, and I think um, regardless, this isn't an issue of whether or not the, the, the bursary that they provide is a worthy cause or not, that I don't think that's necessarily within our mandate to then supply the club with adequate funding so that they have money left over in their budget to do the bursary. So I would not be uh, supporting the, the request for $2,000. Councilor Wainwright. Um, um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, I think we've covered quite a bit of this, but uh, they haven't, um, drawn on the full amount that has been authorized in the past. Um, there's nothing to suggest that they're actually gonna draw on the full amount this year either. It just provides a bit of a safety margin for them. Uh, they're pretty good at fundraising, that they've demonstrated that. I guess, you know, we're all aware that this is a very significant event. It attracts a lot of people to Sydney. It does good things for us. Um, I don't have a, a problem giving them that safety margin. And, you know, it, I don't expect that they're going to draw the full amount unless they actually need to. Thank you. Councillor O'Keefe? I, I, I guess I, I just want to say that, you know, there's no question that this is a good event and this organization need, you know, does good, good things. Um, but the point is, is that there's dozens of other organizations that also do good things. And it's, it was hard for us going through our grants and kind of we had to go through that process. I also note that, you know, next up on the agenda is a request for a First Nations group that's going to want some funding. And I guess, you know, it, it's not that I, I don't think the Torque Masters is a good, and it, that it's a good thing. It's just trying to um, spread the wealth, so to speak, as, as much as we can and providing opportunities to, to other groups um, that haven't had uh, that opportunity. And I guess just as a side note, this kind of um, illustrates to me perhaps, uh, you know, a reason for us to revisit and fine tune our grants in kind um, policy generally. Speaking, um, speaking to the amended motion. Okay. So. The amended. Sorry, yeah, so I, uh, I do not support the current amendment. Okay, I'd Good. like to, uh, count, uh, count, Mr. Humble. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to, again, uh, uh, just a couple of comments about uh, sort of drawing down on the, the amount, uh, et cetera. Again, I just wanted to highlight the, um, and clarify that uh, the motion is, uh, uh, again, in-kind services, not direct funding. Thank you. I'll just add uh, a comment. I, I won't be supporting the amended motion. Uh, I certainly think uh, a Torque Masters in the event is, is very worthwhile in our community. Uh, kudos to the, uh, to the group that organizes and puts it on each year. It's acknowledged as one of the best events of its kind on the island, uh, which I think is a great accomplishment. Um, however, 
Uh, it is uh, the only ongoing uh, event, annual event that uh, has a waiver of town costs. Um, uh, the other is is that, uh, and this point was touched on by uh, by Councillor O'Keefe, um, all requests for financial support should be accompanied by a set of budget projections and for the event. Uh, we received um, dozens of requests for the grant and aid, and with each of them we did receive financial information. I think there was one that we didn't receive financial information for. Uh, and while I appreciate the organization has received funding over the previous years and perhaps without submitting financial information, uh, particularly for a council with five new members, uh, that would have been a, of, uh, of benefit. Uh, the other, to Councillor uh, Fallot's point, uh, I think with the experience uh, on Torque Masters um, organizers uh, with proceedings at council that uh, we would have heard this evening if a thousand uh, was going to, uh, was going to count, uh, present a challenge and we didn't hear that. Um, and so I won't be supporting the, um, I won't be supporting the amendment. Any further discussion on the amendment? I'll call those, uh, I'll call the question those in favor of the amendment. Are those opposed? The motion is defeated. So we have our original motion uh, for in the, uh, for the event in the amount of 1,000. Any discussion on the main motion? I'll call the question all those in favor. The motion carries unanimous, thank you. Apologies uh, for twice making a significant error in uh, Ms. Nelson. <laughs> I will now move to item 11H, which is the monthly building permit report. Receive for I'll move receive for information. Second. Uh, discussion. Uh, I would just like to highlight for the benefit of the audience, which I appreciate is, uh, is dwindling, but uh, those who might come in by video. Uh, that we're uh, pretty much as active uh, in the building uh, permit category, certainly by dollar value of building permits, uh, some nine million, uh, nine, almost 10 million to date last year and 10.6 million or 9.6 million this year. Number of building permits changed a little bit, but, but the value of permits uh, very close. So uh, the planning staff is certainly, uh, certainly still active uh, with building permits. Thank you. I'll call the question, all those in favor? The motion carries unanimous, thank you. Well, now we don't have any of the reports. We'll move to uh, correspondence, and we have item 13A, the request for Tree Appreciation Day, and the letter from uh, Ms. Linda Comer, uh, dated April. I'll move the recommendation that the request for the town to hold an official Tree Appreciation Day annually in the month of November be referred to strategic planning. I'll second that. Uh, discussion? Uh, I'll just make the comment that uh, 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 Ms. Comer is, is, is certainly extremely passionate about this event. Uh, uh, Ms. Gifford uh, supported that and uh, having attended the, uh, the uh, Sydney Community Association AGM, somebody else uh, asked questions with regards to support of, of the event. So we, we appreciate the passion within the organization and that the Community Association has also engaged the public uh, and they've contributed uh, in, in submissions to the uh, urban forestry strategy. Uh, I think we have an excellent urban strategy uh, uh, final report uh, that we've moved separately to the strategic planning process. It was highlighted that the uh, Tree Appreciation Day uh, or Arbor Day uh, <coughs> was a short-term uh, recommendation within the, uh, within the uh, report. However, there were a number of other short-term, uh, mid-term and long-term, but uh, I think this council has certainly heard um, from uh, Ms. Comer, the community association and the community at large of the of, uh, of uh, the importance and the passion for this event. So I'll now call the question, all those in favor? And that motion carries unanimous, thank you. Move to item 13B, we have a request for funding for the traditional First Nations war canoe races. A letter from the uh, canoe club dated June 7th. This is a recommendation that council consider a one-time contribution Discussion. 
Councillor Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think that um, it would be more helpful if the motion actually uh, had a dollar amount and not consider but actually approve. Um, but I did have a question through you to staff. Do we have any idea um, whether Central Saanich provides support for this and if so, how much? Not sorry. They have not yet received a request, but uh, apparently it's coming, uh, uh, as well as uh, as well as North Saanich. Mm -hmm. No, North Saanich has received it. So yeah. So Central Saanich will be receiving a request as well. Uh, Councillor Rintoul and Councillor O'Keefe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I may, the staff um, opening paragraph of the request uh, last sentence. We would like to thank you for continued contributions the past year's uh, working races. Um, with that in mind, did Sydney contribute, and if so, how much? Through the mayor, um, Councillor Wintool, no, uh, that's uh, uh, that's incorrect. Uh, as far as as far as uh, to my to my knowledge, uh, this is we haven't received a request in the past. Yeah, and to um, perhaps for clarification, my understanding that this is a form letter that goes out to businesses yeah. as well. And as I think with the additional information that we received, uh, um, that uh, Victoria Airport Authority, Bouchard Gardens, and Saanich Peninsula Hospital has supported this in the past and uh, will be continuing. So I, I think it's a bit of um, a form letter um, situation, but a good question. Um, and so I would, um, I would go back to the fact that the motion is, is uh, uh, doesn't specify an amount, and I, I think uh, for council to consider is 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 for council to to if they see merit to go ahead and propose a specific amount not not just to to read that uh, recommendation so uh councillor garnett you were the mover yep do you wish to I'll remove do you wish to true i'll remove the original recommendation okay and a seconder and mr terry and turn to oh, sorry okay okay so are you going to amend it no, not amend it. We've no, just removed just it. it. Okay. So, oh. do we have a new motion from the f from the floor from the from council? I'll move that we uh, approve support of two hundred and fifty dollars. Second. Discussion, Councillor Ridden Tool. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm comfortable uh, with that suggestion. I, I might have been inclined to go uh, slightly higher. Um, to sort of the $500 mark. In, in part, my uh, thinking was just around the budget here and looking at the contributors that the mayor's already noted and the fact that they're going out to other municipalities. Uh, certainly something that, that we want to support, uh, you know, being held in, in uh, Brentwood Bay so we can assume that, you know, some of that economic, economic spinoff, you know, happens here in our community as well. Um, I'm happy to support at 250, but I would also uh, support a friendly amendment to see that rise to 500. Okay, I, uh, with our experience this evening with friendly, <laughs> <laughs> with friendly um, I would I would uh, I would entertain a motion to amend. I have a question, uh, Councillor uh, Fallon. Is that thank it? you? And then Councillor Key. Okay. Uh, direction through you to staff. Um, where is the money coming from? <laughs> Um, there was previously a um, uh, well. There's there's two potential two potential streams. One is economic development. Uh, if uh, council sees uh, the economic development fund, if council sees fit, and uh, uh, another po uh, potential source I'd want to look into it is there was previously uh, um, in the budget um, uh, an item uh, relating to uh, to First Nations engagement, and I'm not sure if that's still there but uh it's a possible source but uh for 250 dollars or thereabouts uh we'll uh we'll find the appropriate uh funding Put the source. Head around mm -hmm. um i i would be challenged to take it out of the economic development because although i recognize that there may be some spin-off as such for back to our community i think in the spirit of our economic development fund it doesn't quite fit in so I wouldn't su support that. Um, 
and um, I, I would support it. I think uh, also in light of that we've just celebrated uh, National Indigenous Day on Friday, I think uh, it's, it's worthy of, of putting some money towards it, um, but I think we need to figure out where we're gonna take the money. Thank you. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I was also thinking more along the, you know, $500 mark. So if there was a, an amendment to that effect, I would uh, su support that. Um, and I guess maybe we'll have a bit more of discussion to see if there's a, a willingness to entertain that. Um, in terms of where it comes from, I agree with Councillor Fallett. I, I'd rather it see it come not from the Economic Development Fund, but if we do have a, a fund on First Nations engagement, I'd prefer to see it there. Mr. Humble. If I can, uh, through the uh, Mayor, there may be another um, funding source as well. I think we've got about 500 left in the uh, grant and aid as well. So there's oh. another potential. Thank you for that reminder. And I, I, I guess, you know, going through the, the grant and aid process and other funds that we distribute, I, I haven't seen a, a whole lot that we've been able to do to support our First Nations communities. Um, they've been good over the last uh, little while coming out to, to our events to support the opening of the museum, the opening of the new community safety building. So I, th I see this as a opportunity for us to, to, uh, to show some support for their events as well, so. Um. Councillor Garnett and Councillor uh, Fallon. I, I completely agree with uh, Councillor O'Keefe and I'm willing to make an amendment that the amount be lifted to $500. Do we have a seconder? Second. Any discussion on the amendment? I'll call the question, all those in favor? Opposed? One opposed, the motion carries. So now we're now looking at the original motion and the amount of $500. Any further discussion on the main motion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? So, sorry. The main motion. Can we? Can we yeah. The just motion is it? to provide support in the amount of five hundred dollars. Oh. Okay. I thought that's what we just. No, we um, we amended the original motion because the original motion was two fifty. Okay. Yeah. So I want to vote for this one. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> Ms. Nelson, could you read the motion, please? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just explain what happened. So the original motion, which was passed, which was moved by Councillor Wainwright and seconded by um, Councillor Fallett, was to approve support of $250. Then there was an amendment to uh, change that amount to $500, which was passed. Therefore, we add the five hundred dollars to. So the motion that you would be, that you're um, considering right now at this time is to approve support of five hundred dollars. Okay. And I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Nelson. No more amending motions. <laughs> Okay, we have no bylaws, uh, development permits, variances, uh, no new business. We'll move to correspondence for information. Move receipt. Second. Uh, discussion, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we have no notices of motion here, uh, so we have a motion to go in camera. I, uh, I move that it is in the opinion of council that the public interest requires that persons other than members of council and officers be excluded from the meeting to consider confidential matters relating to personal issue pursuant to section 90.1a of the community charter and that council continue the meeting in closed session second, second. those in favor I motion ask? carries you like thank you a motion to adjourn second those in favor motion carries